This lesson is about the startup scripts executed by your Bash shell. Whenever you log in or whenever you open a new terminal window causing a new shell to start running and prompt you for input, that shell begins by executing some of the standard startup scripts to establish the environment in which it is to run. These scripts contain commands that are executed by the shell just as if you had entered them from the command line. The first script it executes is named ETC Profile. This is the script that is run by every login shell in the system, so you can put things here that you want to be common to every login session. Now, even if you're the only person using the system, it's convenient to put system wide stuff in here because that way you'll have them whenever you're logged in normally or logged in as root. The first thing that's defined here is a function. This function can be used to add a new directory to the path variable, but it will only add it if it's not already there. This is kind of handy because it's very easy to have something get stuck in the path more than once, and it's a bit of a bother to go around and clean them out. If the same directory is in the path more than once, the shell will search that directory more than once to find a command, and it just slows things down. I'll be explaining functions later. Now right here you can see where the pathmunge function is used to add a bin directory to the path. You'll see it used in other places too, but by defining the function here at the top of the first script that's executed, it becomes available for use everywhere else. Notice that PS1 is set here, but it's not set the way we showed it earlier. That's because I customize it in one of my other scripts later and replace the one that's globally defined here. The ulimit command is used with a C option to set the maximum size of a core file. When you run a program and that program crashes, the operating system dumps a copy of the memory image of that program to a file named core. Now you can use that image in a debugger to determine what exactly caused the program to fail and caused the crash. That's known as performing a post-mortem on the program. However, these core files can be huge, and setting this limit keeps the maximum core file size to one megabyte. It's just a safety measure to keep the disk from filling up with garbage. When I go into heavy debugging, I remove this limit. Now, depending on what kind of login session this is, the UMask is set. Remember that the UMask setting determines the type of permissions that are assigned to newly created files. After that, you can see where some shell variables are being defined, and the pathmunge function is used to add another bin directory to the path. After that, the defined variables are exported and a for loop is executed. Inside this loop, every script that ends with a period sh that is inside the profile.d directory is executed. The scripts you see here, ending with a dot sh, are the ones that are executed. This is just a convenience. You can put a startup script here, or you can edit the profile script. It's generally easier to enable and disable global stuff by working with the scripts in this directory, but that's up to you. You can see that some of the scripts end with a .csh for the C shell. The next script executed by your login shell is the one in your home directory named dot bash profile. The first thing it does is execute the script in my home directory named dot bash rc and I'll go to that one in just a minute. About the only thing I do is add some directories to the path and I set a couple of more environment variables. Any line that begins with a hash mark or pound sign or whatever you want to call it is a comment and is ignored by the shell. The actual name of that pound sign character is Octothorpe, but I've heard it called everything from a number sign to a gridlet. Also, up at the top, you may have noticed the tilde character used as a directory name for dot bash rc. The tilde is another one of those characters that the shell translates for you. Tilde is always translated into the name of your home directory. Here, let me show you.
You probably remember me telling you a few lessons back that I had modified the way LS works by having it automatically indicate the type of the file it lists. Now this is where that's done. I have defined LS as an alias for LS with the A and F options. Every time I enter LS on the command line, it's translated to LS with these options. You can have all the aliases you want, and some people use lots of them. When I installed the system, it automatically included the I option on Remove, Copy, and Move. The I option always asks, are you sure? I don't want it to do that, so I just put a gridlet in front of the alias definition, which made the whole line a comment, and I'm not bothered by the silly questions anymore. Here at the bottom of the file, I've set some environment variables and a couple of path settings that are required for some software that were installed on the system. Oh, uh, one more thing. Right here, the system checks to see if the existence of the etc. bash rc file, and if it does exist, it executes it. For some reason, I have another path munge function here, but this is where I set the PS1 prompt. Because this setting comes later than the other one, this one replaces the previous one. Also, this command at the very bottom sets a special facility inside the shell that allows me to edit command line stuff using the VI edit commands instead of the arrow keys. That is, I can use the keyboard characters to move the cursor instead of the arrow keys when I'm working with a command line. Okay, that's kind of a quick run through, but it should give you a good idea of what's going on. I realize I've created some questions in your mind by skimming over some stuff, but stick with me and I'll fill in some of those blanks beginning with the next lesson.